Janelle Matthews was born on February 9, 1972, in the city of Santa Barbara, California. Her biological mother, Tara Martinez, became pregnant at just 13 years old. After a month Janelle was born, Terry didn't think she was ready to be a mother, so in March 1972, she put Janelle up for adoption. At the same time, Jim and Gloria Matthews were looking for a child for adoption. That's when they became interested in Janelle and decided to adopt her. Janelle then moved in with her new adoptive parents, Jim and Gloria, and her new older sister, named Jennifer Mugenton, in Greeley, Colorado. According to her family, Janelle was a very smart girl, full of dreams, who saw everything on the positive side and never got into trouble. She was a member of the Sunnyview Church of the Nazarene, just like her parents. On December 20, 1984, around Christmas, a holiday concert was taking place in town, and Janelle was going to perform with the school she studied at, Franklin Middle. She was very excited for the performance, as it had been two weeks since she had seen her colleagues during the winter break. Janelle insisted that her parents let her go. She said she would be careful and after the performance she would go straight home to rest, as she was recovering from a bad flu. She then arranged with her friend Deanna Ross to get back together that night. Her parents weren't going to attend the performance along with Janelle, as Jim had promised Jennifer that he would watch her basketball game that night and Gloria was out of town taking care of her sick mother. After the performance, Janelle got a ride with Deanna and her father, Russell, and was dropped off at her door at 8.15 p.m. They waited for the girl to come into the house to make sure she was safe and then they left. At around 8.30 p.m., Janelle took a phone call from a teacher at Plate Valley Elementary School, where her father worked as a principal. She was trying to get in touch with Jim to let him know that it wouldn't be necessary for him to go to work the next morning. At around 9.30 p.m., just over an hour after Janelle was dropped off at home, he arrived to find the garage door open and the house empty. At first, he thought that Janelle might have decided to spend a little more time with her friends, since she hadn't seen them in a while, but soon he noticed three strange things that caught his attention. The first was that the heater was on, but no one was home. The second was Janelle's favorite shawl thrown behind the couch, as if she had just taken it off. The third was her shoes perfectly lined up in front of the couch where she always used to sit. Jim tried to keep his cool and started looking around the house for Janelle, as she could be somewhere else. That's when Jennifer got home from the basketball game. He asked if she had seen or spoken to Donnell that night. Jennifer said no, and Jim began to get extremely worried. He called the police, reporting Donnell's disappearance, and within 15 minutes, the police arrived at his house. The police searched the surroundings of the house. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry, but they found footprints in the snow. Footprints that were too big to be the girls, indicating that someone had been circling the house and looking out the windows. Despite this, the police thought that Janelle had escaped on her own, but Jim assured that there was no reason to justify that. Besides the fact that it was snowing and too cold that night for Janelle to go outside without a coat. Eventually, the police issued a public note in an attempt to get some information that could help find a girl. The note read as follows. On the night of December 20, 1984, Janelle Matthews was dropped off at her parents' home by family friends at approximately 8 p.m. When her father returned home later that night, he noticed that Janelle had missing. She was last seen wearing a red blouse, dark gray sweater, dark gray skirt, light blue ski jacket, and sleeping shoes. Janelle's father was trying to convince the police that there was no way she could have run away, as a lot of nice things were happening in her life. A friend was going to sleep at her house the day after she disappeared. There was a school performance and Christmas was coming. Janelle was excited about all of this. Usually, when a minor runs away from home, it is common for them to come back within a few days, but the days passed and the girl did not show up, so the police started working on the possibility that Janelle had been kidnapped from inside her own home. They continued their search, but for a long time, no clue was found. The police then became suspicious of Terry, Janelle's birth mother. It is not uncommon for parents who put their children up for adoption, sometime later, come back with the intention of getting their children back. Without informing Terry that Janelle was missing, the police began monitoring her steps in hopes of finding any clues that she was involved in the case, but she was soon dismissed as a suspect. Investigators then questioned friends, teachers and family. No one had been near the house at night, and neighbors also said they saw nothing. A month after the incident, Janelle's family attended a vigil that was conducted by the Church of Greeley, which they were a part of. 
The case had enormous repercussions throughout the media in the United States. Even the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, gave a speech on March 7, 1985 about missing minors and talked about the case of Janelle, asking that newspapers collaborate to find her. Despite all the investigation and backlash, the case was dropped and 10 years after her disappearance, Janelle was declared legally dead. Jim and Gloria, the girl's adoptive parents, found it too painful to continue living in Greeley, so they decided to move to Costa Rica. Jennifer, Janelle's adopted sister, got married and moved to Washington. On July 23, 2019, 34 years after Janelle disappeared, the case took a turn. At around 5 p.m., workers at a construction company who were preparing land for the installation of an oil pipeline found a body during investigations. After forensic and DNA tests, the police were able to identify the body, which was that of Janelle Matthews. The area where the work was carried out was located in Greeley, 24 kilometers from the victim's house. From that moment on, the case was reopened and was treated by the authorities as a homicide. Colorado investigators began looking throughout historical records to verify who was the former owner or lived on the land where the body was found. According to the autopsy, Janelle was killed with a gunshot to the head. Her family was informed about the body, and they returned to Greeley so they could give their daughter a proper burial. The police had a suspect they kept secret, a man named Steve Pankey. Steve was a former Greeley resident who was currently living in the city of Twin Falls in the state of Idaho. He ran for lieutenant governor of Idaho in 2010 and for governor in 2014 and 2018. Steve was the first person the police discovered had a connection to the land where the body was found. Soon, he became the prime suspect. On August 15, 2019, police searched Steve's house in the Twin Falls, claiming he had a direct connection to Donnell's kidnapping and death. At the same time, Steve and his now ex-wife lived just three kilometers from the victim's home. He denied any involvement in Janelle's kidnapping and death. In his words, 31 days ago they searched my house and took a bunch of stuff, and I'm still at home, so obviously they didn't find anything connecting me with the case. Steve even volunteered to take a DNA test if necessary. In 1984, the year Janelle was kidnapped, Steve was a pastor of the same church she and her family used to attend weekly. He told police that he had never seen the girl before and that he only learned about her from the news he heard on the radio about her disappearance. Days later, in an interview, Steve contradicted himself, saying that he had been the pastor of the church and that he was even accused at the time of stealing a piano. Police said that Steve not only knew Janelle personally, but also knew her family and that he himself has been involved in investigation several times over the years, saying that he knew about the case and could help with the investigation. During a conversation with the police, Steve unintentionally let slip that the footprints in the snow found at the time were covered up with a rake, information that only the police had access to. For those who don't know, a rake is an instrument used in gardening to sweep leaves. Steve also said that he saw the children returning home from Franklin Middle School and that on the night of the kidnapping, he was at his house preparing for a trip he would take with his family the next day to Big Bear Lake, California. The suspicious police decided to question Steve's ex-wife, Angela Hicks. According to the source, Angela said that they made the trip on December 22, 1984, and not on the 21st, as Steve had said, and that the trip was not planned, but was totally unexpected. And that after returning from the trip on the 26th, her husband showed an unusual interest in Janelle's case and even forced her to read articles related to the case for him. Also according to her statements, that same week, a car stored in their house caught fire, being later discarded in a junkyard. A few months after Janelle disappeared, Angela and Pinky were attending a service and a minister told the microphone that Janelle would be found safe and Angela claimed she heard Steve muttering that the minister was a false prophet. In 2008, Steve's son was murdered and during the funeral Angela once again heard Steve muttering the following, I hope God didn't allow this because of Janelle Matthews. Angela didn't pay much attention to it at the time. After all, they were going through a very difficult time that was the loss of their son. According to a KTVB report, Steve said that when the police searched his home, they seized a DVD of his son's funeral, claiming that the DVD had recorded Steve speaking the phrase Angela had heard. Steve said it never crossed his mind and he never said those words. In another interview, Steve said he was gay and therefore would have no interest in girls like Janelle. In that same interview, 
he admitted that he had some problems with the Greeley police and that they were chasing him simply because they didn't like him. According to prosecutor Rob Miller, in 2003, Steve said he had inside information and wanted a deal to provide a location to find Janelle's body without having to give names. It also turned out that Steve was a patron for a popular podcast that covered the entire Janelle case called The Trail Wind Code. On October 13, 2020, aged 69, Steve Pinky was arrested for kidnapping and first-degree murder of Janelle Matthews and a 5 million bond was set. According to authorities, Steve was obsessed with the case and that was one, one of the factors that made him the prime suspect. Prosecutors also told jurors that Steve had made incriminating statements over the years about Janelle's case. The indictment says Steve kidnapped Janelle from her home between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. on December 20, 1984. At some point during the kidnapping, Steve decided to shoot Janelle. He was held in Ada County Prison in Idaho, awaiting his transfer to Colorado to stand trial. Janelle's adoptive parents were more relieved to at least know what had happened to their daughter and have given her a decent burial. The trial began on December 2, 2021. During the trial, Steve's defense offered a different theory. According to Steve's former attorney, Anthony Viorst, the person who took Janelle's life was someone she knew. He says that Norris Drake, whose mother lived across the street from Janelle, was responsible for the crime. He said Drake was at his mother's house on the day of the murder, but was missing from several hours the same night. Detectives interrogated Drake, but he was quickly ruled out as a suspect because his family provided an alibi for him. After hearing testimonies from several witnesses, Stephen Pankin testified. He testified that in the past, he had lied about his knowledge of the case. About this, he said, The truth is that I invented a lot of things. It was just me trying to be a big man and to be useful on the case, okay? I was not aware of anything. I am innocent. Anthony also told the jury that Steve was just an attention-seeking guy and a true crime junkie, but not a murderer. Prosecutors said during the trial that there was no DNA linking Steve to the crime. Analysts tried, but failed to recover any usable DNA from Janelle's remains or clothing. On November 1, 2021, they reached a verdict. The jury found him guilty of making false reports to authorities, but they were at an impasse of the other charges of kidnapping and murder. For that reason, the judge declared a mistrial and prosecutors announced that they would seek a new trial on the murder and kidnapping charges. Steve Pankin is still in custody awaiting a new trial date which is expected to take place in October this year, 2022. For Janelle's Matthews family, the news was so devastating that they didn't even want to discuss it, as they believe Steve is responsible for the crime. So, that's it. Thank you so much for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.